Hey guys, how are you today? So lightsabers have the preconceived notion to be able to go through literally anything in Star Wars. Well, that's actually not quite accurate. There are a lot of materials in Star Wars that actually are lightsaber resistant, and today we're going to go over 10 of them. Starting in at number 10, we have ADW-4's Electrostaff. During the early months of the Clone Wars, General Grievous was busy, hopping from planet to planet overseeing the offensive of the Separatist forces. He heard rumor that the Jedi Order would soon dispatch a small group of masters to one of the CIS's newest strongholds. Now the CIS, if you didn't know, stands for the Confederacy of Independent Systems, or in other words, the Separatists, the guys Dooku was controlling. Anyways, he was unable to greet the Jedi himself, so Grievous decided to send a droid in his place. He appointed the mercenary unit ADW-4 to the battalion of B-1 battle droids on the jungle world, hoping that the famed killer would be strong enough to win Grievous some new lightsabers. When AD and Mace Windu eventually faced each other, Windu ignited his purple saber, hoping to strike the droid down as easy as any other Separatist pile of scrap that he had faced in the past. But when he swung his swords toward the mercenary, his blade was met with the crackling noise of an electrostaff. This weapon, most famously wielded by Magna Guards, was able to parry away lightsaber strikes with ease. It was in part due to this weapon that Windu actually lost his first duel with AD. Number 9. Electron Walls Electron walls were the red laser separators that divided the hallways of the Naboo hangar. We saw them once during the three-way duel between Obi-Wan Kenobi, Qui-Gon Jinn, and Darth Maul during the Separatist blockade on Naboo. These electron walls weren't necessarily designed explicitly for defense against Jedi and their weapons, but instead to prevent artillery or heavy troops from reaching important parts of Naboo's defenses. Number 8. Ultra Chrome In Legends, Ultra Chrome was a material heavily used in the manufacturing of weapons of war. Most notably, we found it in the starships of the Ancient Republic and Sith Empires. During the rise of Exar Kun, when he betrayed his masters and followed the teachings of Frieden Nad's Phantom, Ultra Chrome was one of the most important resources in fleets of the time. Later, during the rise of the Galactic Empire, Ultra Chrome fell out of favor in starships, but was used by the Inquisitors in their battle attire. Number 7. Vodosiosk Bass's Staff In one of Exar Kun's earliest flirtations with the dark side, we could say, he dueled his fellow Jedi, a Cathar, named Silvar. The Cathar were giant, lion-like humanoids, who not only were physically stronger than most other beings, but also had the natural weapons that most felines featured, namely razor-sharp claws and massive fangs. While dueling Kun, Silvar unsheathed her claws and slashed the future Sith Lord across his face. Enraged, Kun swelled with anger and the dark side of the Force filled his limbs. He brought his lightsaber down on top of Silvar, nearly ending her life, but in the nick of time, Master Bass slapped Kun's hand with the tip of his quarterstaff, causing him to drop his lightsaber. Unable to stop the torrent of anger streaming from his mind, Kun then went on to fight his own Jedi Master. In the ensuing duel, Bass imbued his staff with the Force, allowing it to resist most of Kun's lightsaber strikes. So this one in particular I find interesting because it's almost like a form of Tutuminus, where you know Yoda could control Force Lightning with his hands when it was being shot to him and other Force users in the past could do this. But if you were powerful enough to imbue a object with the Force, then essentially you could repel a lightsaber on that object too. So it makes me wonder what if a Force user was so powerful that he could imbue himself with the Force entirely, at least his skin, and therefore be impervious to any lightsaber attack. Could he do this forever? It's like in real life where Shaolin monks can resist Pierce attacks and other attacks, but only exemplified in Star Wars. Number six, Neuranium. Neuranium, like some of the other materials on this list, is a uniquely powerful metal in the galaxy. If used for its original purpose, this incredibly dense steel-like substance was able to stop dangerous radiation from leaking out of or into whatever it contained. Since it was so powerful, it became a favorite substance for making art and statues. Even Emperor Palpatine himself commissioned the creation of Sith statues out of Neuranium. Since Neuranium was so dense, if you were to touch the tip of a lightsaber to its surface, it would last quite a while before inevitably melting away. Number 5. Armor Weave Armor Weave is an incredible lightsaber resistant material, not because it performed better than Ultra Chrome or Beskar, but because it was relatively cheap for what it did. Most famously worn by bounty hunters and soldiers for hire, you probably have seen Armor Weave a time or two if you've ever read Boba Fett or The Land's Tale, because the scaled material is usually what you'd see one of their colleagues wear. Number 4. Beskar 
Now, of course, this one you guys know a lot about because of The Mandalorian Show. The same one that you see bar patrons marvel at whenever Boba Fett walks into the room or Mando walks into the room was one of the most iconic suits that a bounty hunter or mercenary could wear. Composed of Beskar or Mandalorian iron, the suits of armor were used by most Mandalorian and also a handful of imposters, like the unfortunate Jodo Cast. Cast pretended to be Boba Fett while collecting bounties, allowing him to get a massive pay boost due to Fett's high fees. Eventually, the true Fett found out, then lured Cast into a brutal trap where he murdered him by dropping an entire dome on him. While Beskar might not be able to endure thousands of tons of stone and marble falling onto it, it definitely is mighty enough to deflect a few lightsaber slices. Number 3. Amphistaffs. Now these were primary weapons of many Yuuzhan Vong warriors, and one of the most traumatic things a Republic soldier could face on the battlefield. The Amphistaffs were actually living creatures, and looked much like a thickly armored snake. Whenever Vong soldiers used it in battle, they were able to cut through almost anything they turned the staff towards. Sometimes they simply used the serpent-like weapon as a sword, and even at others, they tossed it as a long-range weapon that could pierce enemy armor. They were pretty OP. Whenever it went up against lightsabers in combat, not only could the Amphi staff resist the Jedi's blade power, but they didn't even seem to be phased by it. Number 2. Disc Blade Now, this disc blade was a weapon that was very similar to Exar Kun's master's Vodosiosk Bass quarterstaff. The force-sensitive warriors who used the disc blade needed to imbue it with force energy to make it resistant to lightsaber attacks. But once they did, they were able to endure slash after slash. The disc blades were incredibly unique, I might add. Since they were the weapon of a light side offshoot of the Jedi Order, the Zyson Shaw, and not the Order itself. As you could imagine, the disc blade was used for ranged attacks, as often as it was used for close quarters dueling, thanks in large part to its circular design that made it easy to spin through the air. And finally, at number one, we have Cortosis Swords. Now, these Cortosis Swords were very special, not just because they were lightsaber resistant, but because they could actually turn a lightsaber off if it came into contact with it. Famously used by the Sith millennia ago in their fabled Sith swords, Cortosis even managed to find its way into a simple arm-mounted shield, which Sith masters were known to use in combat. In the time of the Galactic Republic, Vader went up against a Jedi who wielded a Cortosis blade in one of his many missions during the Purge. Vader faced off against Shady, Potkin, and a group of Jedi who managed to avoid Order 66. Hopefully you've seen my comic issue that I've covered regarding this, or if not, you've read that comic in Legends, it's pretty cool. Now even though Potkin deftly used her Cortosa sword to deactivate Vader's red lightsaber, she wasn't actually able to win the match, of course, as the Dark Lord himself simply wrapped his fingers around her neck and snapped it with his enhanced cybernetic strength. What are some lightsaber resistant materials that I didn't mention that you maybe want me to cover in a, another top 10 video, or I could compile it in a top 20? Or if I listed them all, which one was your favorite? That I mentioned. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new today and escaped with me to a galaxy far, far away. Leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you're new here, and I will see you all in the next episode of Star Wars Theory. Until then, remember, the Force will be with you. Always.